some of the speakers we have already uh, got to know uh, during the presentations, and uh, maybe uh, Mr. Krupp, Mr. Götz, and Nils, you uh, should uh, introduce yourself maybe quickly. So maybe you start first. Yeah, my name is uh, my name is Michael Krupp, and I work at Magazino as a robot software developer. Uh, my main area is uh, SLAM and localization. So, uh, as Damon already mentioned, we are moving towards collaborative uh, SLAM and are also cooperating with Google directly on this project. So, Oliver Götz. Okay, um, I'm Oliver Götz from SAP. I'm a software architect there in an uh, applied research team. Uh, and we are currently taking part in this cloud robotics uh, initiative and uh, providing some business content, uh, some first business content for uh, the cloud robotics platform. My name is uh, Nils Jakobsen. I come from the company Mobile Industrial Robot. And we make a lot of robots based on ROS, and they are out in a lot of industry. And that's why we would like to team up here. To, to see how can this cloud robotics help us out. All right. So maybe the first question which uh, I'm going to ask uh, to all of you is, what are the opportunities and limitations that you see in the future of Rust-based IT stacks? So you may address technical points, business-related points, or innovation-related perspectives. Maybe Hendrik, what are the opportunities, limitations that you see in the future of Rust-based IT stacks? Well, so, as I probably said most of it already in, in my talk, so I, I see very much we need to figure out how do we solve security uh, in, in a good way. I, I think finding sort of the right balance between what do we need to do at the edge and what can we do in the cloud is going to be important. At the same time, I see the opportunity as being able to leverage a lot of the services that we see in, in, in the cloud today, so we don't have to reinvent all of these services all over again. The robotics market, honestly, is too small. So I see lots of opportunities of leveraging other economies, just like Nils is doing for batteries. You know, they're not coming out of, they're selling a lot of robots, but compared to EVs, you know, he's still a small player. Uh, so we need to figure out, just like we've done for batteries, how can we leverage all of these services that we're seeing elsewhere? So, so I, but finding that balance is, is going to be the key to how we get to success. It's amazing how that perspective actually changed from earlier on. We were talking about real time, etc. Now it's obviously IT security. Maybe we have not talked about privacy issues yet. Oh, yeah. So that's also related. Oh, absolutely. No, no, no. no. So privacy, so security to me involves very much privacy. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if you look at the service applications, what data can you not send out and and we have a project right now, actually, where we're working with LG, where all of the stuff that is sort of privacy related is done in the home cloud, and only then do you publish it out, because otherwise people are going to be scared about this. So, so I think there are opportunities to, to, how do we do this the right way? Mm -hmm. So, Michael Krupp from uh, Magazzino. Yeah, so Ross has a lot of advantages for us. So, um, first of all, it's a very close to the robotics community, so we have uh, a lot of developers that come actually from an open source or ROS background, so for us it's kind of the natural language as a roboticist uh, that is also used in research and in other companies. Um, and we also benefit a lot from the core components that ROS is giving us, so the communication stack and all those tools that probably everybody is familiar with. But of course there are some limitations with ROS1 and uh, parts or details of this are going to be resolved with ROS2 at some point. But for us as a robotics company that is operating multiple robots, there are also new problems like how do you manage a fleet of robots? <coughs> how do you do monitoring? How do you uh, do data analytics across multiple robots, all these things um, where we see more potential in the cloud uh, technologies. Magazzino being a European-German company in Europe, in Germany, OPC UA is currently a hot, very hot topic. How does it af affect you in your considerations using ROS? Uh, OPC, UA. OPC UA. So the 
I hope we, do, we don't use this at the moment. All right. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Can I yeah, uh, maybe uh, I, I switch the question to you. No, All right. Just a comment to the OPCA UA. I think it's, it's very nice to see somehow we have some kind of unity here in the in industry there. And, and, but we still need to see it come out in products. The, it's not commercially quite ready yet. The Siemens and others say they have it, but it's, it's hard to buy. So, so right. let's see in a few years and we will be there. Okay. All right. Maybe I ask a question about opportunities, limitations that you see in the future for Rust-based IT stacks to Michael Götz. Okay, and so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not an engineering guy, I'm a software guy, and uh, when I first got in touch with the robotics, uh, it, it was uh, in, uh, connecting robots to our MES systems or PP systems, and uh, this was uh, done via the PLCs, and for me as a software developer, you have pretty much limited capabilities to, to, to work on uh, on PLCs directly concerning memory, computing power, and so on. And uh, for a while I did nothing with robots and uh, started again, uh, maybe one year and a half, uh, now with uh, mobile robots, uh, like your Mir robots, and using the ROS stack. And uh, for me it's much more con convenient to work on a, a software stack like ROS because uh, uh, as a software developer I can use tools I'm familiar with, uh, and once you get in, yeah, in touch with the architecture of ROS, with the messaging systems, uh, the capabilities of Arvis and so on, it's easier to understand uh, how a robot is working from, an, uh, yeah, from a software development uh, point of view. That uh, makes things easier for, for me personally. Um, and uh, yeah, limitations. It's also the the security uh, thing we uh, heard uh, sometimes. So open uh, software is good, but uh, in this case, uh, especially was uh, one is too open for a software development company like SAP, I guess, to uh, de develop software directly on top of ROS uh, because uh, um, you ha you work pretty much. On a, close to the robotic uh, hardware or uh, operating system and uh, you might uh, harm the, the robot uh, with, with your sof uh, software stack uh, and, but you don't have the experience in, in, in robotics to uh, differentiate with what you are doing. So um, that harms a bit the uh, capabilities for us, I guess, to deploy standard software directly on the ROS level. Layer and maybe a, a platform like uh, Cloud Robotics comes into pl uh, into place uh, there because we can focus uh, on software issues. Um, we have standardized interfaces. Uh, we have certain limitations, uh, uh, so authorization concept, uh, security concept, um, where we are sure that uh, we uh, that the robot is always operational and uh, yeah, we can focus on our stuff. Mm -hmm. Niels? So, so I come from the other side, working in robotics for, for many, many years, and now we're just moving up, uh, seeing how this logistic layer is, is coming onto us. Uh, I would say uh, deploying all the robots out, we, we try to make them very flexible. Robots should be flexible, but we all the time see that we are always surprised by what the customer needs they're always different. We, we try to make it, okay, you can dock in, you can uh, put things on top, but they always come up with new requirements. And that's always put a lot of constraint or press on, on our software. So they, um, this ability here to have a kind of open modularization system would be quite uh, important to us and, and still have it in a way that's safe enough and also not taking too many resources. So, so we think that uh, if you can build that into the future, that will be, be quite useful because then the robots can be used many more places because they are always more or less specialized. Okay. Uh, Opportunities, limitations, Damon? <laughs> um, so I, I've always found that like the, the really powerful, or the, the reason I think Ross became so successful actually is 
this, uh, the open source nature, the, the federated nature, um, but that's only part of it, right? I think actually the, the real secret sauce was is that um, it came with so much from the very beginning, right? So it was, it was built for a very specific purpose. They had, built, had to build a whole bunch of tools to make it useful for themselves, speaking of Willow. And um, when it sort of, you know, came out and was generally available, you could, uh, you could already build so much and understand so much of your system immediately. And they had solved a bunch of uh, really complicated problems, both at an infrastructure level and at a uh, just a robotics level for you, right? So it was very attractive. And then the the federated approach um, and the open source approach then allowed it to just grow very very quickly. And so I think this is you know one of the really strongest things about about ROS, but it's also um, kind of the the limitation at the same time, because uh, you know I, I think in industry ROS is really sort of seen as the wild west. It's a great place to move super fast, uh, like. See, um, see your robot moving, you know, sit down, and a week later you have uh, coffee delivery or beer fetching or something, right? There's these, these sorts of demos, um, you know, you see them on YouTube all the time. Uh, but, you know, industry, I think, is actually specifically sometimes looking for things that move a little bit more slowly. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's both, good, uh, both good and bad. And um, I think that's the sort of inspiration that, uh, that, that, we, look, uh, that we take in... Um, our approach towards you know, crafting an ecosystem that is industry friendly. Okay. Maybe the second pass, and that's a question for Hendrik specifically. I mean, we have accompanied many initiatives uh, during the years, both EU private initiatives, etc., about open source robotics, and currently there are other initiatives underway. There has been sometimes criticism about the quality, the maturity of ROS, etc. But on the other hand, that system has picked up steam and built up critical mass, as we have seen. Is ROS here to stay for the foreseeable future? So what is your, what is your feeling? So um, that's a good question. So, so I don't see a real competitor right now. There's clearly a number of, of, of systems out there that, that, that want to try and go after this. I know SoftBank has an initiative of trying to come up with their version of this, but I think, uh, as was mentioned before, until you get a system that is simple enough to use and that has enough benefits to outweigh ROS, you know, every university today using ROS because the starting curve is terrible, you know, it really takes time to pick it up, but once you pick it up, there's sort of enough tool that it makes a huge difference. One plus one is suddenly four for, for doing development, there's enough modules out there. I think what we're missing is that Quality assurance for ROS module is anywhere from zero to 100. Uh, so, so, you know, there's a lot of crap out there. There's also a lot of really good stuff, but the signal to noise ratio is sort of one. So, so we need to, if, if ROS is to stick around, we need to have a way of doing better quality assurance. We need to get to a level where it was sort of mentioned before how do we make sure that it actually compiles long enough? How do we make sure we do software that is backward compatible? You can't have like Rust 1 to 2 where suddenly none of your code compiles. I'm just like, whoever did the software engineering, it's an F. You know, that's just not going to cut it in industry. You know, we just need to be able to do this much better. So if Rust has a sustainable future, I think it has to find a way of addressing some of those issues that, that industry has, has a big value in. So, so I think it has a future, but I think we need to see some behavioral change that, that it gets to a maturity where from a software point of view, it is truly mature. And I haven't seen that yet. So I'd, I'd, for that reason, there is room for competition. I'm just not seeing anybody in the US right now throwing money at it. I'm not seeing uh, anybody in Europe. I think there are Asian initiatives that would love to figure out if they can come up with a competition. But I would say it's very steep because the tool suite is just amazing today. Okay. So that's a question for Michael. And uh, we have just heard. Um, you collaborate with Google um, uh, on the open, on, on, yeah, open source uh, cloud-based robotics, and it's interesting to know f for us um, what is actually how, or what, to what extent does it strengthen your unique selling point as a company, as a product, and on the other side we see a potential commoditization of functionalities by provided by the cloud and by related offerings. How do you define your unique selling point given this kind of architecture and this kind of offering? 
So first, first of all, I think our unique selling point in the end is selling robots that are successful at our customers. <laughs> and so we build robots that operate in warehouses and work, do this task autonomously. And in the end, what matters is that we achieve this task. So um, I would say this is our main unique selling point in the end. And how we achieve this is then more the next part that I'm going to answer. So um, at Magazino, we have a lot of experts in the robotics fields, like uh, all the things we need, like perception, navigation, localization, behavior reasoning, data analy analytics, and so on. And uh, at the same time, uh, with a company like Google, we have a lot of expertise in infrastructure and uh, really proven expertise over more than a decade in cloud. And we think it's, yeah, it's just a natural way of um, collaborating with a company that has that much experience in this area and benefiting from each other. So. Um, for example, uh, this uh, collaboration on the Cloud Cartographer um, SLAM project came to be because we were active in the Google Cartographer open source project and then uh, more and more got to know each other and uh, got more in touch also outside of just the normal open source collaboration and, and then, yeah, just thought about how can we benefit from each other? Like Google gets insight into the challenges of a robotics manufacturer, and at the same time, we can benefit from their mm. uh, experience in the cloud area. Okay. So as a representative of SAP, uh, of course, SAP is, you mentioned this, is uh, not primarily interested in or does not have robotics or has not have robotics in its offering and had, had also reservations regarding open source, at least that's uh, what, what the image is. And the idea is now, or the, uh, the, the question is, to what extent is robotics now becoming an offering of SAP and what does open source play in it? Yeah, okay, um, also uh, regarding um, yeah, robotics, I think we've been at some degree into robotics. Uh, I just uh, told my little experience connecting uh, um, manufacturing robots to MES systems. But uh, I think uh, you're right in this point. Uh, there's something new now in robotics, at least for SAP, which is uh, that we have more robots uh, which can act like autonomous agents now. Uh, so we uh, like, uh, again, here transport units from Mir Magazino. Um, and uh, additionally, we, uh, they have much more capabilities regarding perception, uh, and this also affects uh, us as SIP um, because uh, this is uh, this allows us to yeah to define new business processes based on top of uh, those new cap capabilities, um, and. Uh, yeah, I think uh, robotics will become more, more and more uh, important for us as well. Uh, also because uh, uh, the, the software and the hardware is uh, yeah, getting much uh, more together now. It's uh, at least my, my feeling. Um, yeah, and uh, regarding open source, uh, you're right, we, don't, uh, we are not uh, an open source company yet. Uh, but we have some uh, open source uh, projects like, uh, I don't know if you know it, uh, Project Gardener, which is a kind of Kubernetes, uh, multi-cloud Kubernetes uh, administration uh, uh, software. And uh, fortunately, we also changed our internal processes, uh, which allows us uh, to go more into open source. And uh, uh, because we are here in an open source uh, community, uh, also with the cloud robotics, we definitely consider uh, yeah, publishing some things in open source. The decision is not made yet, uh, but uh, it's uh, at least a, a point we, we are currently considering. Okay. 
Niels, uh, you mentioned you have been benefiting greatly or, uh, lot, uh, from, from Ross uh, when uh, actually coming up, designing, engineering, uh, introducing to the market your vehicles. To what extent are you relying on community efforts regarding functionality provision versus, for instance, in-house engineering? Do you steer somehow efforts by the community or how do you balance it with in-house efforts uh, towards functionality de development? First, I'll say I would probably never start at MIR if it wasn't for ROS being available and so easy to, to come up and get started. So, so we were so few people and had so little money at that time, so we needed some kind of platform for the software that could help out our hardware. But then as we grew and, and get more people in, the, then you, you tend to specialize more. Uh, It's also a matter about resources there. Uh, it has to run more efficiently, and then you slowly start to take out some of the nodes and apply your own. So, so it's a gradual tendency to go from a very general system to a much more specialized modules, as we have this capability. But we, we hope that we're doing the next couple of years uh, is also going to uh, give something back to the community. I think uh, David told about this uh, tr trickle effect there. And I think that uh, we, we're almost ready uh, to be there. I think we just had a very busy time just earning some money the first couple of years, and, and now we can and start to have some uh, overhead that's, that will be okay for, for the rest of the community. All right. A question to Damon. Uh, so you're supporting ROS, et cetera, offering services, offering the uh, cloud environment. Why settle on ROS and not create your own Uh, source, uh, open source software stack for, for instance, mobile navigation or robotics? Um, so it actually sounds a little, little bit like a trick question, like, because I feel like people in the, in the ROS community are constantly building new navigation stacks and uh, things like that. Um, I mean, that's sort of what it's all about, right? Uh, so I, I think ROS is, um, you know, it's, it's really more uh, about how, uh, about building a, a community or an ecosystem where everybody can kind of talk to each other. And um, this sort of Uh, like I said, uh, standardization through popularity, right? Like if um, somebody creates a very popular SLAM algorithm, that SLAM algorithm suddenly defines the interface to other SLAM algorithms, right? So everybody wants to, if you want to um, be the next best SLAM algorithm in ROS, well, then you um, better adhere to the current favorite SLAM algorithm's API so that people can try it out and see for themselves how much better it is. Um, so you know, I I think our approach is uh, exactly the same as uh, as it has always been inside the ROS community, right? We would um, like to have an opportunity to create cloud services that can compete with some of the best ROS nodes out there on things that we think are core to uh, general robotics problems. Okay. All right, and uh, I would like to open the. Uh, yeah, the questions to the floor, to the audience. Uh, so please uh, ask questions you may have to the panelists. So the micro microphones are available. So, yeah. <laughs> And I will pass the microphone then here among the panelists. Uh, my question would be, um, we are talking about... Um, industry connecting through cloud platform and um, I'm thinking uh, if you have any vision how let's say if you nowadays work with uh, specific let's say vendors um, on uh, let's say localization or navigation or slam whatever you do uh, you will surely Of obviously offer these cloud capacities as well as uh, IE stuff, so uh, learning stuff and su such. But for me as a new, let's say, incomer to the market, would be interesting, should I or would I be in position that I should begin again with the learning or I will get from Google services so robotic Google services, something more, so not only learning capability, but also some experience that others already go through. So, okay. I mean, you will learn from Magazino how to do a good slam. 
if I enter the same approach, if you learn over many companies and come to the SLAM 3 instead of SLAM 1, would that be in any kind, is there any vision how to, um, so can, can I apply for with additional fee to get not SLAM 1 and learning services, but SLAM 3? So that, that's, okay. And if this is still appropriate in some relation to the vendor that actually pay for this <coughs> development? Maybe, Damon, you take yeah, that question I'll, about I'll, certification or assistance. Yeah, um, let me, I, I, I hope I understood the question properly. Um, so if it's all right, we just continue talking about SLAM because I think it's useful to think about a concrete, concrete use case. So in, in the SLAM case, right, we have Cartographer, which we do uh, in the open source, uh, as an open source project. Um, and then you know, we're carefully evaluating internally you know, what sorts of systems that we've built for sort of massive, scale, massive scalability for the kinds of problems that we're trying to solve uh, you know, in other domains, right? Can we actually convert into something that you know, might fundamentally change how roboticists solve the SLAM problem, right? And, um, and we're trying to do that for ourselves and create this um, you know, SLAM as a service, more or less. But um, we are you know, primarily interested in seeing more automation out there, right? A larger ecosystem. So it's not just how can we do like the very best slam, but how can we um, decompose that into building blocks that would allow uh, roboticists like yourselves to go build a competing slam, right? So it is not, it's not like we want to create some uh, black box API for, for our specific slam, but we would like to um, create an API that anybody can go compete with our slam in that way. And we'd also like to help people do that, right? By, um, building the building blocks that enable such a um, very scalable SLAM system to exist in the first place, right? And uh, does, does that sort of answer your question? Okay. Maybe an extension by Hendrik. So, Damon, I, I think partly of the question is also a little bit what, what Roger talked about, which is that through these cloud services, it suddenly becomes possible to have data sets that would be very difficult for you as an individual to, to run on. So we will be able to do regression testing and other kinds of testing where you can actually do comparison of your algorithm to 50 other algorithms on using a much larger set of data sets than would be easily for a single lab to be able to do. So I think there are ways where we can do testing and evaluation at a scale that has been inaccessible for most people before, whether you do it on Google or on, on Amazon, it opens up for opportunities to do new, te new types of performance evaluation. All right. So, more questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, a quick one. Uh, Rust is all about open source, and we heard a lot about it, and it goes a bit in the same direction. Um, what about open data? So it's basically what you said uh, to evaluate. You talked about popularity, yet yeah, that's one measure. But I think a better measure would be if you have well-structured open data, which ROS modules work well, in which environment, with which components. You have a huge heterogeneous landscape there. Uh, I, I heard nothing about that. Uh, is it going to happen? If I look at Amazon cloud services, do they going to provide this kind of data? Is there any, any thoughts on that? Um, so okay. Depending on exactly what you mean by open data, do you mean like example data sets? Or, yeah, so, I mean, I think we're thinking about the open data problem in a, in a couple ways, right? For one, um, there was the issue of like privacy, security, of course, Google, GCP, Google Cloud, like can't see your data, won't look at it, right? Um, the, but then, you know, there might be very interesting data sets available for um, people to learn about machine learning or to train things on and stuff like that. Um, you know, Cartographer at least has quite a few open data sets. I helped collect a bunch of them in the Deutsches Museum. Um, you know, so we're, we're big fans of doing that sort of thing. Creating a, um, you know, creating a common language for, the, for like typical data structures, right? Ross has done a good job of that um, in many ways. You know, we're keeping our eye on that as well, right? Being able to do the same thing. Um, yeah, I think portable data is maybe how we uh, think about it ourselves, right? If you want to be able to open your data or you want to take your data and put it on some other cloud someplace, right, that, that's absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, Niels? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, 
I think it's important that, that, that some of the data you'll give back, but not all of them, because a lot of them will be customer dependent, yeah. and you have to ask them always, uh, will that be available or not? And with all this kind of, of, of privacy coming up, that can be actually more difficult, but if you don't provide any data, you are sure the, that, that your problem will never be solved by someone else. Yeah. Okay. Are there more questions? Yeah, maybe a quick question and also uh, quick answers. There's one. There's one over there. So it's been kind of a running thread in a bunch of these talks that security is one of the big critical sticking points for ROS. It's why ROS2 is needed. It's why the cloud is one of the big sticking points. But if we've learned anything from conventional security, it's that it's expensive and everyone kind of wants someone else to figure it out so that they can just grab that implementation. So where do you guys see the funding or the man hours to actually get a full, secure, hardened robotic ecosystem up coming from? So data security. OK. Uh, I think some of them come from, from the end user because uh, they are demanding from us that we provide that. And then we will give some of that back again to the community. end up providing an awful lot of that just because uh, it's demanded, right? Both, um, you know, legally in some cases and just users want that, right? I, I think security is one of the, um, one of the uh, top things that we talk about when we're pitching GCP to people, right? Mm -hmm. but, so at the same time, I, I think um, robotics also represent a new opportunity for uh, computer security. So we work with the security, the computer security group at, at UCSD because they think this is a cool problem they'd never thought about before. They're used to suddenly, you know, you have ad hoc connections. You have, for them, this is like, this is a headache. You know, like, damn, this is hard. And for that reason, for academics, that's where you can publish new papers and you can do things. So I think we have to suck in the real computer security people rather than having roboticists try to reinvent computer security. And, and at least right now, it's sexy to sort of go in and, and help do this. So, so I think they see it as a new test case. OK. More questions? If that's not the case, then I would like to close the panel. And thank you again very much. <laughs> Applause for the panelists.